audio is going to include student learning out objectives for the interactions of humans and microbes and also the defenses that we have for microorganisms. So there are a lot of student learning objectives for this. I'm going to really try to target what you need to know so that you know how to direct your study for what you will then be assessed on. So let's get started with these learning objectives. I hope you guys have written them out or copied them out um, for yourself so that you can follow along as we go. When we understand that, that humans are mostly microorganisms, they way outnumber our own human cells, we have this coexistence with them that they actually allow us to survive in. So it, it's going to be really important that we understand that when those that normal garden, those normal flora organisms get out of balance, then it means that the microbes then can have the potential to cause disease, which we call infectious diseases. And then also we understand that many more diseases are related to an imbalance of the microorganisms that live in and on your skin, even autoimmune diseases and even mental health disorders. So many different things. The, in understanding this normal garden of flora that we have, this is referred to as your microbiome. The human microbiome um, project began more than a decade ago. We've learned a lot, but there's still a long way to go in understanding how microorganisms become established on our skin. Um, obviously, that process starts as a newborn. We have always thought about the fetus as being sterile because it is in this amniotic sac that doesn't allow for microbes to actually enter. We do know there's some things that can cross the placenta and cross from mother's blood into the fetus and actually harm the fetus. Anything that can harm a fetus is called a teratogen. Um, but we usually think about that fetus as being sterile as long as nothing devastating happens to the amniotic sac or the mother doesn't get an illness that we know can be transferred. Many, you know, certain viruses like HIV, measles, um, rubella, those can actually cross, cytomegalovirus can cross the placenta. So those are examples of ones that can cross. But if that doesn't happen, we think about the fetus as being relatively sterile until that amniotic sac breaks. But as soon as the amniotic sac breaks, the vaginal flora um, are going to be introduced to the fetus. And these are going to be really important that they are because many of those microorganisms in the vagina, as they start to establish colonization on the newborn skin and in the newborn's intestinal tract, these microorganisms will actually help to break down the milk, the mother's milk. So they're all, they have such beneficial roles. So when we look at certain sites that we know have microbes, some sites have very few microorganisms. Some sites are still to, considered to be sterile, like the brain, um, the cerebrospinal fluid and the brain. We even think about urine as being a sterile body fluid until urine exits the body and has to move through the urethral orifice, which is then colonized. But these are just, these are just some sites that we understand some of them having um, not very many microbes, but then others having a lot. Um, we know that in our colons, 95% of the dry weight of your stool is actually, actually microbes, um, not undigested food particles. So most of your colon is filled with microorganisms that absolutely are necessary for you to be healthy. When we think about these microbes, we have these terms that we, we talk about. A pathogen is, is really anything that's going to be have the potential to cause disease in its host. Um, and disease would be any deviation from health. So there's infectious diseases, but um, anyway, a disruption of tissue or organisms caused by microbes. So that these are just basically some definitions for you to um, make sure that you have. Pathogenicity is the potential potential to cause disease. A true pathogen is one that's going to cause disease even in a healthy person. So um, there's some microbes that should never be present. So if they're in a human, they are a pathogen. You don't have to even guess at it. An example of that would, would certainly be Neisseria gonorrhea. That is never part of normal flora. That is never supposed to be there. If that is ever um, cultured from a, a patient, then that is a true pathogen. So that's just what that terminology actually means. 
the progress of infection, when we think about um, opportunistic pathogens, these are going to be ones that are always part of your normal flora, but they should be in very, very low numbers. So if they end up being in higher numbers, they have the potential to cause disease. Some of the things that can cause them to be in higher numbers are going to be um, are, are going to be like when the patient is compromised. So if a patient is very young, if a patient is very old, their immune systems aren't as strong, that could lead to opportunistic diseases. If a patient is compromised because they have another underlying disease that has compromised their immune system, then, then diseases can take hold. There's some um, people who are on antibiotics. Those antibiotics disturb the normal flora balance. So opportunistic pathogens such as Candida albicans, which is a yeast that can cause vaginosis and vag vaginitis. It also can cause thrush and systemic candidiasis. Patients who have cystic fibrosis, this is an inherited disorder um, of the chloride pumps in the cells. So mucus builds up in many of the tissues of a patient with cystic fibrosis. So an opportunistic pathogen known as Pseudomonas, that's the genus, the species is Originosa. Pseudomonas Originosa can end up causing serious life-threatening diseases and usually is the bacterium that will be um, part of the last infection that someone with cystic fibrosis has. So opportunistic pathogens are ones that live in and on you. They are part of your own normal flora, and they're the ones that end up taking an opportunity to cause disease if something um, in the normal flora gets out of balance. The term virulence, virulence means the degree of which something can cause disease, the degree at which it can be a pathogen. There's some microorganisms that we know that can cause disease, but usually the disease, disease is going to be relatively mild. Um, an example of this would be a species of Staphylococcus known as Epidermidis, and Staphylococcus epidermidis, or Staphylococcus Staphylococcus saprophyticus. These are part of everybody's skin flora, and they can actually cause some problems, but usually the damage is pretty local and the damage is mild. But then there's another species of Staphylococcus that we've all heard of, Staphylococcus aureus, and this is a very virulent um, species of Staphylococcus. One of the things that makes it so virulent is that it has hemolysins, Hemolysins have the ability to lyse blood. So that doesn't even sound like a good thing, does it? Some microorganisms are very virulent because they have capsules, capsules that allow them to attach to the human cells and invade them. Some of them are very virulent because they can evade your immune system response. So they, it's hard for you to fight against them. So there are many different variance factors that can lead to um, pathogenicity and can lead to organisms, some organisms being more dangerous than others. When we think about infections taking hold, we know that there's always going to be certain portals of entry that they are going to prefer. An example of this is that cold viruses, it can, only takes one cold virus to be introduced to your nasal mucosa or your eyes, the conjunctiva of your eyes, and you're going to get that cold. But on the other hand, you can swallow thousands of cold viruses and they won't be able to attach. So it's very important that um, to understand that how organisms are going to be, be entering into the body and how, how they're going to actually be able to take hold. So that's what that is referring to. This talks a little bit more about it, this slide, so these are just some examples. I basically just want you to understand um, the, these concepts and these student learning outcomes so that you could briefly discuss, discuss them. So I just talked about infectious dose in, in respect to the cold virus. Depending on where the portal of entry is, some of these only require very few um, actual microbes for them to be um, be infectious. 
and some of them are going to require much more. So we understand for all of the diseases that we've identified and we understand the etiologies, we know what the infectious dose is. We know how much you would actually have to encounter before you you get sick. So you see some examples of these. I'm not going to ask you specifics. I just want you to know that concept behind infectious dose and that we do understand how many it takes. And another example of this that's just applicable is every single day of your life, if you are eating every day, I think most people eat a meal every day, every day of your life you are ingesting microbes that could cause food, food poisoning. Staphylococcus aureus is a very common one, Clostridium perfringens, these are common and you are in, and they're on your food. Our food does not have to be sterile, our water does not have to be sterile, but the numbers should be really low. They should be below their infectious dose. If the food or the liquid has been mishandled or um, allowed for those microbes to grow into numbers that are going to be infectious for us, then you're going to get sick. You're going to have food poisoning. But all of us know that that's kind of a rare event. And luckily, it's because you're not ingesting infectious dose numbers of those. So these are some other examples for you as well to, to see other diseases, just um, for your information. So um, when, we are, when we are thinking about the, these organisms surviving host defenses, which we're going to talk about in a little while, we do know that capsules can help them to hide from the immune system response. There are also going to be enzymes that certain ones can produce that kill our white blood cells. So this is going to add to their degree of virulence and their degree of pathogenicity. That's, so I hope that sort of makes sense. When we're thinking about how they cause disease, these factors, we know that sometimes it's through enzymes, sometimes it's through toxins. They produce certain toxins, whether they are exotoxins or endotoxins. And sometimes it's because they actually make the host defense respond in such a way that it's your own immune response. It's your own mechanisms for actually trying to protect you that end up causing uh, disease. And we'll talk about that in just a, we'll talk about that again in just a second. So when we are looking at exo and endotoxins, I, I do want you all to have an idea that Usually exotoxins are going to be produced by, sorry, produced by gram-positive organisms. There are a few gram-negatives that do as well, but usually gram-positives. And we think about endotoxins as being produced by gram-negative bacteria. Um, exotoxins are some of the most powerful poisons, if you will, toxins, poisons, poisons that we know of. And they, um, they are going to be devastating to the to the human that they are being expressed in. So an exotoxin is going to be released from the microbe. It's going to circulate throughout the bodies, the, the human's um, body, and can do some serious damage as it's, as it's um, moving through the system. An endotoxin is going to be inside of the bacteria. So this is a, this is a particular challenge because what it means is when you go to treat the gram-negative bacterium, that the patient has that's causing its disease, when you kill the bacterium, you're treating it with an antibiotic, you're realizing that once the microbe is dead, the endotoxin is then going to be released. So now you've got to deal with the endotoxin. So this can be of, of a real challenge. When we're thinking about different types of infections, I think this terminology is good for you to understand. So please take a look at these definitions of infectious types. Um, some infections are the primary infection, so that means that this is your disease. Um, this is what you have. An example of that would be chickenpox that's caused from the varicella zoster virus that's part of the herpes family, her human herpes um, family. So we understand that this varicella zoster virus of chickenpox, that's your primary disease. But then actually you really never get rid of chickenpox. It can the virus can stay in your system dormantly for a very long time, and then you can have a, a um, sequelae infection that comes later from that particular virus, and that disease would be called shingles. 
Some viruses are very localized, some are systemic. So some of them stay in just particular areas. You can see that um, boils are caused from staph, up here is an example, are from Staphylococcus aureus, and they're very localized. Warts are from viruses, the human papilloma viruses. We can have certain fungal infections that just affect the feet. Um, we can have, and y'all heard of athlete's foot, you can have ringworm, and that is a fungal infection that is going to be localized. But then some infections can start localized, but then they can enter into the bloodstream and become systemic. So just having a, an idea of what some of these terms are. Acute means that they have the onset happens quickly and their symptoms are usually severe. Chronic means that they can last for a long, come on very slowly and the symptoms can last for a long time. So just some concepts here. A sign and a symptom. A sign is something that you can measure. The observer can actually see it and they can measure it. So a sign would be maybe a rash or actually a fever. So you can measure the temperature, can't you? And know if somebody has a fever. So these would be signs. Symptoms would be something that's rather subjective. So the patient may just be telling you that they have nausea. If you're seeing vomiting, then that would be a sign. But if they tell you they're nauseous, that's a hard thing to sort of measure, isn't it? Um, a symptom would also be like uh, a headache. So saying that some of you have a headache or that you just feel dizzy or you are nauseous, those would be symptoms where signs are measurable. Signs and symptoms come together um, as complexes to form syndromes. So uh, they're going to be used to help to diagnose particular syndromes. These are some examples of signs. Um, and then I've given you examples of symptoms. Many infections can go unnoticed. And when, we, when that happens, we call these asymptomatic. Asymptomatic simply being defined as without symptoms. It's also referred to sometimes as subclinical. So um, these are going to be ones that go unnoticed. And obviously the ones that go unnoticed are going to be ones that can we're really concerned about because they can be transmitted through infectious processes more easily because somebody doesn't know they have them, they don't know to treat them, and they're just transferring them. An example of, of ones that we're, just one example of ones that we're concerned about with this is many sexually transmitted diseases are asymptomatic. This is why when sexual activity begins, um, and as far as development goes, human development, which is normal, when sexual activity begins, people should have routine screening for sexually transmitted diseases because most we know are actually subclinical or asymptomatic. So um, moving along here, just with some of these, um, some of these, this terminology that we think about, we do know that I just talked about shingles as being a sequel, if you will, or a sequelae of a disease that you've already had. But also, there are many other examples of this. So some, some sequelae that can actually happen from polio is that people would have permanent paralysis. Sequelae and polio is caused from a virus. Lyme disease is caused from a bacterium, Borrelia burgdorferi. And what we know is you have an initial disease that a primary disease that is going to be have flu-like symptoms but weeks and months later you can actually have a sequelae a sequel to that where there's arthritis and this can cause lasting permanent damage strep throat a sore throat pharyngitis that is caused from a bacterium streptococcus pyogenes um, this this strep throat is going to be treated not because people really worry that you have a sore throat that sore throat would go away the pharyngitis would go away within a few days, but you get treated with an antibiotic to prevent the sequelae that can happen, which is going to be permanent damage to the heart, and we call this rheumatic um, heart disease. So, you know, the, these the sequelae is something to be think of thinking about. This is why certain diseases will always get treated no matter if the primary disease is mild or not, because if there is going to be a potential for some of these very serious sequelae events, then you're going to have to treat the disease. This, this chart I want you to pay attention to because you should realize for every single infectious microbe that we know that causes disease, 
for some unknown still, but the ones that we know have incubation periods. And we know their incubation periods. Some incubation periods are going to be hours. Some incubation periods are going to be days. So for each disease in microbiology and infectious disease, we actually know for each one um, what type of portable entry it takes, what type of infectious dose it takes for you to get sick. We know what type of incubation period there's going to be, whether it's, it's one that's only hours or whether it's one that's days and some are actually weeks. And then we know that there's going to be this period of time that's called the pro prodromal stage. This is when there might be some mild signs and symptoms that are, are fairly mild. Patients may go kind of not even, um, there are certain people that might not even notice this prodromal stage. And then there's going to be a stage that we call the invasion stage or period of infection, if you will. So during the period of infection, patients are sick. So they are, you know, ex exhibiting signs, they are complaining of symptoms, and they are actually sick. So hopefully they're also seeking help at this point. A diagnosis will be made by hopefully during this time, pretty early on, we hope. And then um, the proper treatment will be handled. Then with all the, the microbes that we know, there's going to be, um, hopefully, if they're getting treated, there's going to be a convalescence period where you're going to see a decline in the signs and symptoms. The reason I need you to know these different stages and that it's known for each of the infectious diseases that we talk about, what this chart would look like for each one, um, is because there are many of these microbes that are you, the patient will be infectious the entire period of this. So um, an example of that, let's just talk about human in, um, immunodeficiency virus. There's going to be this initial exposure to, the, to this virus and there's going to be an incubation period. The incubation period for that usually typically isn't too long. There's going to be an initial illness that oftentimes goes unnoticed with flu-like symptoms. And most patients who are HIV positive never really remember that particular stage. And with that particular virus, there is not going to be a convalescence and an ending. There's going to be a latency and a, um, a dormancy that actually can happen with this virus because it's going to stay in the system. So this, this convalescence since period is actually really not really present on latent, latent diseases. It's going to kind of stay. But what I want you to know is that, that this particular infection, you are infectious to other people the, through every one of these periods. So um, that's what's important about that. Okay. Now um, we're talking about trans reservoirs and transmitters. So sometimes humans are the ones that are ill that are going to be the reservoirs and transmitting the diseases. And some humans are carriers, so they end up having, they may have the disease or mild versions of it, and then become carriers for long periods of time. Some diseases are going to require biological vectors like arthropods, so mosquitoes or ticks, some type of biological vector that is going to be part of the process. And then there are non-living reservoirs as well. Um, microorganisms that live in the soil, and there are many of them that live in the soil, that can be transferred through water, like typhoid fever, and um, that's just an example of that, or that, or, that, or that are aerosolized, so that can be spread just from sneezing or coughing, um, and that can live on objects for, for many different lengths of time. So this shows you some of those particular microorganisms. Some microorganisms can be transferred by animals. Those microbes are called, those infections that are, that are transferable through from animal to human are referred to as zoonotic diseases. So here are some examples of zoonotic diseases. Y'all can just look through these for now. Uh, I'm not going to ask for specific, specifics about this, just that you know that particular definition. And zoonosis being an infection that's indigenous to the animals but can be transferred to, to humans. And we talked about non-living. Communicable is just the idea that it can, it's infectious. So that's synonymous with communicable. It 
means it can be spread from host to host. Some, are, some diseases are easily communicable and others are very much harder uh, to transmit. Influenza, the flu virus is very easily transmittable because it's aerosolized. Hansen's disease, which we know is caused from a bacterium known as mycobacterium leprae, this is actually very hard to, to transmit to another human. I know that historically in written um, things such as, you know, religious uh, writings, it suggests that this is very easily communi communicable, but that is actually not the case. It is hard to communicate to, to transmit this disease. It's not so easy. It can be done, but it's not so easy to, for it to happen. Okay, um, the ways that they can be transferred it can be transferred, much of the diseases we think about being transferred horizontally from one person to another, from inanimate surfaces to another, from animals to whatever, so horizontally. But the, also there's a vertical transfer that can happen, so from parent to offspring through the placenta, so that can actually happen as well. So these just give you some examples of that. What we think about as health professionals is that we do know that some, some diseases are going to patients are going to be compromised or they wouldn't be in the hospital in the first place. And so they're already compromised, they're immunocompromised, and they're going to get the disease once they're in the medical facility. So diseases that are acquired through, um, through being in medical facilities are called nosocomial infections. It's really important that you understand that. Just look this terminology because just looking at some of this data, you can see how important this is, resulting in 90,000 deaths. The, um, just to the economy, what the burden it's putting on the economy. So nosocomial infections are of great concern. And so anybody going into health professions should be aware that it's our job to try to prevent the spread of diseases once we've got a, uh, a client, a patient that's in our care. Where most of these diseases actually occur are urinary tract infections. And the way this happens is because people either get in and out catheters to get a urine sample for testing, um, or they have indwelling catheters that are keeping them prone to having microbes invade into the urethra, into the bladder, causing cystitis, and even up the urinary tract. So you can see where some of these nosocomial infections attack, and um, again, make sure we understand that concept. And because of that, all all healthcare professionals learn about universal precautions. Universal precautions in a nutshell says that uh, you should understand that all patient, all body fluids have the potential of causing any kind, all diseases. So treat every body fluid like it has everything. And if you're being that careful, then hopefully you're not uh, transmitting things to not just yourself, but also from one patient's room to another patient's room. It's very important. Hand washing is probably the most important, it is the most important way of proper hand washing, preventing the spread of disease from patient to patient and also from patient to healthcare professional. So uh, these are some of the types of situations that are used to help prevent the spread and these, this is for your information. Um, there are barrier precautions such as mask and gloves, there's sharks precautions, and then healthcare precautions we just talked about. How do we know, how do we actually identify the organism that is the pathogen? We are still using Koch's postulates. So Robert Koch gave us the, the germ theory of disease and understanding that there is this cause and effect. Disease doesn't happen just because of the side of the railroad tracks you were born on or because of the color of your skin or because of the type of sex that, you're try, that you decide that you want to have or the sex partner. Diseases are, are from etiologies. So there's going to be a viral cause, a bacterial cause, a fungal cause. We know that there are agents that cause diseases. Now, are there more easily ways to transmit diseases? Absolutely. And should people be informed about, um, you know, how to prevent the spread of disease? Absolutely. But we do understand that it is not a judgment. It is not a, um, you know, a, a being 
whatever. So, it, but Koch's postulates, Robert Koch, it um, dis discovered that this germ theory of disease by actually going through a few steps, and we'll take those steps into consideration now. Um, obviously, he used mice, and he was actually using the, um, a microorganism called Streptococcus pneumoniae. But anyway, what he ended up did, what he did instead of people, he used mice. But from infected mice that were infected and with a, a particular organism, in this case, Streptococcus pneumoniae, he he recovered the Streptococcus pneumoniae by taking samples from his mice that were sick. He recovered that microorganism, isolated that microorganism out because, of course, there would have been many other microbes as well in those particular samples, potentially. So he isolated that one out, injected into a healthy host, mice at this time, and then those mice got sick, and he then he took samples from that and recovered the same microorganism. And that proved, those four steps, those postulates, is how he proved that that Streptococcus pneumoniae, especially encapsulated Streptococcus pneumoniae, was definitely a pathogen and was the etiology of that particular disease. Every disease that we've identified, infectious disease, we've identified since uh, his postulates, had these four steps have been taken to identify them. Epidemiology, I want you all to know that epidemiology is um, covers so many different things. The study of disease, the study of disease within populations, how not just what the diseases are, how the diseases are spread, what their stages are, what the incubation stages, prodromal, infectious stages, convalescent, not just all of that, but including all of that, uh, but also how they spread, which demographic of people are going to be most at risk. So it covers so many um, different different areas epidemiology does. Florence Nightingale has definitely given some credit for foundations in modern epidemiology. She noticed, she took notes and noticed that, um, that men were dying from disease that had traumatic injuries that were dying from infectious diseases and that microbes were probably causing those those diseases and that even health professionals were spreading those diseases at certain times. So what the what the goal of epidemiology is, is to actually help public health departments develop prevention and treatment programs based on how we can predict those diseases will move through populations. So a reportable disease, this requires incredible communication um, so that we can get the information quickly, spread the information quickly to help prevent the spread and help to prevent deaths. So uh, the idea that reportable, what reportable means is that there, not all diseases need to be reported, but there is a list, and this is your list of reportable diseases in the United States. I certainly don't want you to memorize this, but I want you to know you could always go to it and look at it. But this is, these are the diseases that if a patient has by law, these diseases are going to be reported to the local health department, which reports them to the state health department, which reports them to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, um, which is the notification center that's going to help us to keep data and knowing how these diseases are spreading, what the demographics are, and just to help to, to control this. So some ideas that we think about mortality rates is actually defined as the number of people that you expect to die of a certain disease that, that of the people that have that disease. So if something has the mortality rate of 10%, it means that 10 out of 100, roughly, I mean, you could sort of do this, is that 10 out of 100 patients that get that disease are likely to die from it. So that would actually be considered a very high mortality rate, by the way. Um, Anyway, so that's what that, that means. You can look at some of the data that's collected um, on just hepatitis C and then chlamydia, you can see. And so this data helps us to understand and hopefully go out and then educate and prevent um, spread of disease, especially in high-risk populations. There's, all, there's typically, when we think about diseases, there, uh, when we talk, talk about the term index case, it means the first patient that actually has been tracked back so we know where that first patient actually happened 
and then the spread of the disease happen. When we talk about certain infectious diseases, some are endemic. That means they're going to be in that area. They actually have, they have a steady rate of infection in a particular area over very long periods of time. Some diseases have are sporadic though, so they have irregular kind of in the, um, intervals that they have in random, um, random events. An epidemic is when you see the numbers of disease actually increase at an unexpected rate in this particular population. So, so we're seeing more than we expected to see in a particular location. A pandemic means that you're seeing epidemics across the globe, across the world. So you can see the different, this different terminology and how it's used in endemic being in just a particular area, you know that those cases are going to be there over long periods of time. You can see an epidemic where you're seeing clusters more than you would expect to see, sporadic, you know, it's kind of irregular, and then pandemic that is worldwide. So um, an example of, of like a pandemic would be HIV infections and AIDS. That is now a pandemic. We know that it is uh, one of the leading causes of deaths of infectious diseases. It still is. The good news about that is that we also know that um, that people who get quick quick diagnosis and proper treatment are actually having living um, are able to live normal lifespans now. So the again, that's good news about that. Okay, so. Um, in Chapter 12 and 13, this non-specific innate defenses and specific defenses, we're going to, um, I'm going to give you again the basics of, of this, the defense mechanisms that a human has to all of those things we just talked about. Remember that the basic defense that we have, these, this innate, these innate defenses that we have that we're born with are going to be skin that acts as a barrier, eyelashes, hair on your head. Um, the hair in your nose, cilia that are in our lower respiratory tract, saliva, these are just all basic innate defenses that we have. And remember, innate defenses that we have too, that just soon after we're born, are going to be the colonization of our microbiome, our normal flora. That cannot be, um, you know, you just cannot forget about that because that is so important to our basic defense. So these are some of the things that we're born with. And again, this chart, for those of you that like uh, charts like this, you can see these, these innate nonspecific barriers that we have, like physical barriers, chemical barriers. And then we're also going to have other things that we know we secrete, like enzymes that help to break down bacteria um, in our in our tears and in our saliva. Most people, if they have their eyes cultured like tears, it looks sterile. Nothing really looks like it's growing. And that's because they are working. Um, we have acid in our stomach. We have an acid mantle on our skin that the microbes that live on our skin are, are providing this almost invisible shield that we have. We have acid in our stomach that end up taking the numbers of microbes down from the foods that we eat and drink. So uh, again, to all referring to inoculating dose, and the stomach greatly reduces the microbes number um, when the food and liquid is in our stomach before it moves on into the intestines to start rebuilding back up. So when we think about immunology, this is the study of the immune system. Um, and we are going to know that we not we have these microbes that are going to be really I'm sorry, these uh, cells that are going to be really important and these, cell, these very specific cells and protecting us against particular microbes circulating around in our bloodstream. We have neutrophils. Neutrophils are a special kind of white blood cell that are going to fight against bacteria. We also have macrophages. Macrophages are derivative of monocytes, which also are a special type of white blood cell that act as big eaters, macro meaning big, phage meaning to eat. They come and um, will literally eat foreign cells. If they see something as foreign, they will ingest it and, and remove it from the system. We have dendritic cells that, that remain in our certain tissues, especially tissues where we know are going to be 
potentially high at risk for invading pathogens that are going to be part of our immune system. They're not specific against any one particular microorganism. They are nonspecific. They're going to attack many different types of ones. These are here. We're born with them. They're going to be protected. This is a, just a little visual for you to see how they can actually, um, certain cells phagocytize. We have many of these cells in, it, throughout our system, some of the areas that they're found in our thymus, which is an endocrine organ that helps the maturing of these particular white blood cells. We have the lymph nodes, tonsil spleen. All of these areas are so important to our innate immunity, our nonspecific immunity. Our lymphatic system itself, many people know about their arteries, their arterial vessels, and their venous return vessels. So many people know about those systems, those um, vascular systems and the circulatory system. But a lot of people don't know that we have another entire set of vessels that are embedded in our bodies called the lymphatic vascular system. These vessels, which are very similar in structure as far as um, anatomy goes to our arteries and veins, more, to the, more like the veins, these vessels, these lymphatic vessels, are going to be transporting a fluid called lymph. Lymph is the fluid that actually is very similar to blood plasma, except it is even more composed of water with less proteins. This lymph is bathing, this water is bathing our cells. Lymph comes from blood plasma leaking into the tissue spaces. And as it's leaking into the tissue spaces, it's becoming lymph. It's called lymph. It's bathing our cells and our tissues. It's helping to transport substances. But at the same time, it's pushing the lymph that's there into the lymphatic system so that it can be returned to the bloodstream. So in this third picture, you can see how lymph gets returned back to the subclavian vein where it is going to be put back into the bloodstream and just recirculated. So this is, a, the, this is um, very important to understand that every tissue we have, from our fingertips, our toes, to breast tissue, to every one of our organs, they have to have lymphatic return. So if an organ has been damaged, either through trauma or through surgery, um, or whatnot, and if the, it typically there's going to be damage to the lymphatic return. And so those tissues are going to be at risk for edema, swelling in those sites, and potential infection because they can't circulate that cleansing lymph the way that it needs to be. But we're, we're born with this lymphatic system, this system of vessels, this system of nodes that are strategically placed throughout these vessels these vessels of the lymphatic system, the lymph nodes are going to, lymph is going to have to move through those nodes, and as it moves through lymph nodes, it's being filtered. And this is where any microorganisms may be detected and um, re removed, destroyed through, through the system, but also it's, it's where sometimes cancer cells will also be detected in the lymph nodes. And if the lymph nodes are doing their work, they're going to be destroying the cancer cells at that site. So, so microorganisms, any path, potential pathogens, um, and any kind of debris is going to have to move through the lymph system. It's going to have to move through a network of many lymph nodes to fil that, that are being filtered before it would be returned back to the bloodstream. So in the bloodstream, we do have whole cells um, that actually are very protective. Our red blood cells are protective. Our red blood cells carry oxygen. And so I know we think about that as mostly being providing our energy, our ATP for our cells, but that oxygen is also going to be protective because it's going to be deadly. Oxygen is toxic to anaerobic bacteria. So as long as we have good blood supply, we shouldn't have anaerobic infections, and meaning infections that are caused from microorganisms that um, oxygen would be toxic to them. Examples of anaerobic infections would be from the genus Clostridium. Clostridium perfringens uh, causes gangrene. Clostridium tetani causes tetanus. Clostridium botulinum causes botulism.
Clostridium difficile causes a gastroenteritis that um, can be severe and crippling. So oxygen and our red blood cells help us. Neutrophils, a white cell I said that is going to fight against bacteria, uh, bacteria. Lymphocytes that fight against viruses and cancer cells. So we have, um, we have these things in our blood that help us. Plasma, the blood is actually mostly plasma. It's, it's usually more than 50% plasma, which is the extracellular fluid. That plasma has is mostly water, but it does have important proteins that are circulating around and have a lot of different functions. Some of them are antibodies that protect you. Some of them are going to be clotting factors. Some of those proteins are go going to be hormones that have many diverse uh, properties and functions. And uh, obviously in your plasma, you're also circulating around electrolytes that are vital for the functioning of the body and nutrients and even gases. So serum is plasma, blood plasma, where the clotting factors have been removed. So that's, when you hear the term serum, it just means blood plasma, but the clotting factors have been removed from it. These are examples of many different types of, white, of, of blood cells that we have as defense mechanisms to keep us healthy. So they have so many different functions. Um, and, you know, some of the things that we know happen, I've already talked about neutrophils and monocytes being behaviors. We know that these cells can actually initiate damaged tissues, can, can send out signals to initiate inflammation. And when we think about inflammation, there are four signs of inflammation. And I would want you all to know these four signs. Um, they are redness, warmth, swelling, which could be called edema, and also pain. Each one of these signs, redness, warmth, heat, swelling, and pain are, are part of this process. And actually all of them are, believe it or not, these are good signs because in, inflammation means the body is trying to heal itself. The redness, the warmth, and the swelling are all coming from blood, increased blood supply to that site. You need increased blood supply to the site for healing. It's going to help with metabolism. The increased temperature is going to help to, re to inhibit any microbes that might not like that temperature increase. The swelling means that there's going to be white cells moving to the site, fluids moving to the site that are going to be carrying antimicrobials. So all of these things are going to be good things. Pain is a good thing because it lets the person know that this is an area that needs to be babied, if you will. Now, if there is too much inflammation, then that can be damaging. But inflammation up to a point is actually a good thing. It can be healing. So, um, okay, so, um, so we do know, we talked about that it has the potential to cause tissue injury. And uh, so anyway, we do, we have to think about that. Up to a point though, we know it's a good thing. Um, there are different enzymes and mediators that cytokines we that refer to these that are going to help to mediate the response, the inflammatory response in a patient. We know that pus is actually a sign that the body is fighting against something. This means it, it looks white because there's so many white blood cells there. And they're there to actually help to clean up the site, to kill the organisms, and help to protect you. So pus isn't always a bad sign. It's a sign that the body is fighting this. Fevers, fevers sometimes are of unknown origin. We understand, and we, we it's really hard for people sometimes to leave a fever alone. But a fever can be so protective. And so we need to understand that the body produces these pyrogens that actually reset your thermostat. The hypothalamus controls the thermostat. Those pyrogens are there for a reason. The resetting that thermostat is going to increase metabolism, increase healing properties, de discourage the growth of microorganisms. There's so many benefits to this. But if it gets too high, then that can be a problem as well. So if it gets too high, then it's going to, you're going to have to make the decision to give an antipyretic that is going to actually bring that temperature down because we do know that um, we do know that you can get into a positive feedback loop with temperature and then it can be it can actually be deadly. 
we have a substance that um, infected organism, uh, infected human cells, these are human cells produce a, a substance called interferon. Interferon is really protective because it helps to support, to prevent the spread or limit the spread of disease. So it is going to help to limit the spread of disease to neighboring cells. So one, once a person's cells become invaded, that cell is doomed. But the cell in the, in the meantime will be producing this interferon that it will be releasing so that the neighboring cells will be protected. So that's a very important uh, naturally occurring defense that humans have is the production of interferon. And by the way, we can make interferon and we use it to treat patients that have viral infections and even cancer and has been used um, showing good results with those. It is not a magic bullet. It is not a cure for viral infections and it is not a cure for cancer, but it is definitely used to treat and does show that it limits the spread of those diseases. Um, we have other proteins called complement proteins. There are many of them, you see, 26 different proteins. These complement proteins, when they become engaged because of an invasion of a microorganism or because of trauma to tissues, this is a cascade effect that will have three potential outcomes. Those three potential outcomes, one is inflammation that we just talked about as being a good thing. Another one is called some, is called opsonization. These complement proteins will actually coat pathogens. They will literally surround the pathogens so that they can be phagocytized by the macrophages, the white blood cells that eat them and take them out of the system. So inflammation is the first. Opsonization, which is coating a foreign organisms so that they can be phagocytized is a second. And the third thing that the complement system helps to do, these proteins will act together to, to actually puncture into pathogens and cells and lyse the cells. This is called cytolysis, the lysing, splitting of a cell. So there are three outcomes from complement protein activa activation inflammation, opsonization, and cytolysis. The third and final step of host defense, and I am going to actually do this on, uh, you'll have these that you can look at, but I'm going to kind of go through this um, with drawing something for you because I think it just makes better sense than looking at some of the textbook. For specific immunity though, you do have to understand that what an antigen is and what an antibody is. An antigen, they're both proteins, but an antigen is going to be something, and this is the term that's used more than immunogens. This is a term, antigens are going to be, we have our own self-antigens that are ours and are uniquely ours, and no one else has antigens like us. But every single species, every single individual and species have their own self-antigens. And if it's a foreign antigen, a foreign one to us, and we get invaded by it, we're going to have the potential to make a specific another protein called an antibody that will be circulated around in our body fluids that can attack it. So antigens are specific to organisms, membranes, or outer capsules, and antibodies are proteins that are going to be made in response to those, an those specific antigens, and antibodies do the destroying. Antibodies do the attacking. Antibodies are going to be the ones that take out specific antigens. The beautiful thing about our specific immunity is that once we start identifying foreign antigens in our system and in our ecosystems, we will make the antibodies that are appropriate that either neutralize it or destroy it. This is a beautiful thing specific immunity is. So what I'd like to do at this time is actually tell you, and, and it's going to require writing for this, tell you about specific immunity. I hope this lets me write on the board. I think it will. Um, so in specific immunity, well, no it is. Okay, so in specific immunity, there's going to be two types of specific immunity. The specific immunity is going to be either humoral, I have to write on this, sorry, humoral, which humors mean fluids of the body. 
So the fluids of the body we know to be saliva, tears, lymph is very important, blood plasma, which is where lymph comes from, and then gets returned back to, doesn't it? So any extracellular fluids of the body, we're going to have in specific community, we're going to have something happening uh, that's going to be happening in the humors of the body. We're also in specific community. There's going to be two types we talk about. There's going to be something called cell-mediated, cell-mediated immunity. I'm going to need for you all to understand this thoroughly, okay? So these happen at the same time. So when a, a foreign antigen, let's say this is the bad guy, this is our pathogen here, inner or potential pathogen, enters into the body. This, is, is, this pathogen has a particular specific type of antigenic determinant that is unique to it. So for example, um, the measles antigen looks very different from the mumps antigenic structure. But this is a pathogen, an unknown pathogen. We don't know. It just, it just either entered through our GI tract or maybe it entered through our nasal mucosa, maybe, um, uh, you know, whatever. So the skin, but it just entered into the body. Now, let me first tell you, this, these are both happening at the same time, but I can only talk about them one at a time. So I want you to pay attention to first the humoral, then we'll talk about cell-mediated, but your understanding that there, these are kind of happening at the same time. In humoral immunity, there is a very special kind of white blood cell called T, excuse me, called T lymphocyte. Oops, I mean that. This is not supposed to be. They're called B, excuse me, B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes that are going to be circulating around B, B, sorry about that. Part there, B lymphocytes that are circulating around in your system, and these are little, these are immature ones at this time. They're not active. They're just waiting to get an order from some for something. If a pathogen comes in, some of these B lymphocytes will be notified that this pathogen's on site, and they will become active. They will actually take this in, this very particular pathogen. They'll take it in and they will become active. And what that means is they're going to study that structure of that antigen, that protein. And once they know it, they're going to undergo mitosis. Y'all know mitosis means to the cells to divide. And when they divide, they become very special cells called plasma cells. These are plasma cells. Plasma cells have one function. These very specific plasma cells, they're going to produce a, a protein called an antibody. That antibody will be sent out from those cells into the fluids of the body, and these proteins are going to have the exact counter structure that is specific. This is specific to that antigen. These antibodies will start to be pumped out in huge numbers, their numbers are going to go up steadily as these, under, as these plasma cells are undergoing mitosis. These antibodies are going to be being released in all the fluids of the body. And the numbers, when we think about the numbers going up, the numbers are called the titer, titers. Of, sorry, this pen is not writing where I'm actually writing, so it's so weird. I hope y'all can see this. So anyway, these are called titers of antibodies increasing. As the titers of the antibodies are increasing, cell mediated is doing something too, but as these titers of these antibodies are increasing, your signs and symptoms of your disease most of the time are starting to decrease. You're starting to get better. Now, of course, this takes a little time. So while the antibodies are going up, you're, you're feeling sick. But eventually, you don't keep it, do you? Or we'd be sick all every day of our life. We wouldn't have gotten to live long. But these antibodies are increasing, and then you're going to get over it because of that. So this is actually kind of a beautiful thing, the making of these antibodies that are released into the fluids of the body. These specialized proteins that have the complementary specific shape to each particular pathogen, antigenic determinant sites that you encounter. But a really important thing to know, too, 
to note here, and this is so important in specific immunity, is that when these plasma cells are undergoing mitosis, there will be a few of them that will become what are called memory, memory B cells. You know what those cells do? The plasma cells that are making antibodies for your initial disease only last long enough for you to get well. But these memory B cells, they have one function. These memory B cells have one function in their lives. They will live for decades circulating around in your system. And they will have one function, and that's to look for this antigen. If you ever encounter this antigen again, whether it is two decades later, whether it is six months later, these memory B cells won't have to, um, they won't have to re remember how to make the antibody. They know how to make it, and the titers will go up quickly. They're going to go up so quickly that you never get a symptom of that again because they've attacked it before it can ever take hold. And this is why you do not get things twice. And if it weren't for this, and cell mediated, it's happening at the same time, if it were not for specific immunity, you would never get out of toddlerhood. So this is an important thing to understand, the specificity of antibodies to antigens. And any time that you ever had a foreign antigen encountered in your system, you have made these antibodies that are going to neutralize it. Now, I promised you that something was also going on over here. What you need to know that's going on over here is this concept that in cell mediated, there's a special, very special type of cell that's involved here. These cells are called T8 cells, but I also want you to know that you will see them on lab reports sometimes as CD8 cells. And I hate to tell you this, but here's another name for them that you sometimes see. These are called cytotoxic, cytotoxic, let's see if I can, cytotoxic T cells. So these are all the same kind of cell. I think you often, most often see them uh, referred to as this. These are T, a special type of T lymphocyte. And we may remember from endocrinology that T lymphocytes are called T lymphocytes because they mature from hormones that are released from the, thy the thymus, the thymus gland. So anyway, T lymphocytes, these are a special kind of T lymphocytes. And these T lymphocytes, let me just tell you what they are. They are wicked. And that what's going to happen when an, inact an inactive CD8 cell sees this guy, when this sees this, this is going to undergo mitosis. It's going to figure out exactly that shape of that foreign antigen. And I'm going to tell you something. When it does and becomes active, these cells become active, they don't need to make an antibody to do their dirty work. They're going to do cell to cell combat. They're going to just hook right up with it and take it out. Um, you know, I, I give the analogy that sometimes, and I think this, this makes sense to you, if you thought about the military being protected, just like specific immunity is protected for you, the humoral immunity would be like our Air Force, our jets dropping bombs, which are the antibodies to fight against this, this enemy, where our CD8 cells, our T lymphocyte CD8 cells, these are the Marines. They're dropping in and they're actually doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with these, with these things. So this is, the, this is the two different approaches that are happening. Another beautiful thing about cell mediated is when this T8 cell, CD8 cell, T8 cell undergoes mitosis, there will be a few memory T, memory T lymphs that are going to be directed just against this particular antigen. So these memory Bs and these memory Ts, if this guy, this same guy, ever invades again, within minutes, these cells are attacking. The memory Bs are attacking by making an antibody that's released into the fluids. 
the mentees are attacking by doing cell-to-cell -cell combat. That specific immunity in a nutshell, I need to, you all to kind of know these cells, know what cells are involved with each, B lymphocytes and CDA lymphocytes, and I've got a couple, just a, one more thing to tell you that this entire thing hinges on. This entire specific immunity hinges on a very particular type of T, a different T type of, type of T lymphocyte. Here's the type. This T lymphocyte is actually called a CD4. It's a C. It's not right in my pen. It's CD4 cell. It's also sometimes called a T4 cell. And it's also referred to sometimes as a helper T cell, a helper T cell. These cells, these cells, the entire specific immunity is hinging on this. We also know that parts of the non-specific immunity, the complement system, is depending on these two. Inflammatory uh, reactions and even fever. Because what we know about these CD4 cells is that they're the ones that give the alarm when this happens. When this, when this pathogen enters the body, they're the ones that are firing the alarm. They are the sirens are going off. And these sirens are going to activate these and these cells, these sirens. This, this chart looks crazy now. But I hope that you all are understanding that these cells are the ones that recognize this is foreign and they start releasing their enzymes that are going to actually, these, these um, interleukins, they, these are just going to be molecules that help white cells to talk with other white cells. And in that talking, these interleukins talking with other white cells, they're alarming them. They're, they're sending off the sirens. They're the ones that are causing the B lymphocytes to become active, and certainly uh, CD8 cells to become active. So without them, the entire specific immunity is lost. These are the cells that are attacked by the HIV, a human immunodeficiency virus. That, that virus has special attachment sites for these cells. This is why this virus is so devastating to your immune system. This virus itself does not kill you. It does not kill anybody. But what it does is it takes out your specific immunity so that you end up a host, if they're not being treated now, if they're whatever, it ends up that the host is going to die from an opportunistic disease that they should have never gotten sick from in the first place. This, our own, their own organisms that end up causing devastating diseases to them because their immune system is that compromised. What we, we tend to see is that um, if once the numbers of these cells get below 200 cells per microliter of blood, then a person is in what we call full-blown AIDS, uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Um, if those numbers get, or if they, once they go below 200 cells per microliter. Okay, so this is also why if you see, and usually it's the CD4 counts. If you see CD4 counts on a patient's report, you know that they are monitoring, um, they're monitoring this HIV positive status patient for, for, for either being an AIDS related complex or being in full blown AIDS. So these slides actually go through a lot of this. I'm not going to ask you anything I didn't say. Please be aware that I am not going to ask you anything I did not say. So a lot of these slides actually, um, oh man, okay, I need to I gotta figure out how to erase this. Uh, um, eraser. Oh, that didn't work. Um, that worked. That doesn't work great, but okay. So these slides just complement that. But remember, the way I said it, said that talked about these terms, the way I gave you these student uh, learning objectives. This is the way my quizzes, quiz questions will be, and also the way that tests on. Um, 
the test questions will come from. So anyway, there, um, let's see if I, I don't want to really forget anything. I do want to let you know that um, there are different types of antibodies, and I do think that's an important thing to understand, that there are different classes of antibodies. And I have a slide on that. I have no idea where it is. Here it is. Um, so in these classes of antibodies, and this is a little concept check that you can see. So let's go back to this one, and, and I'll let you know about it. So not all antibodies are, have the same organic structure, but they are all antibodies. The, the, the ones that the antibodies, these proteins that are specific against specific antigens, the first time you have a disease, that class are called IgM antibodies. Well, actually, I'll just go over this to see. So IgM is going to be that first antibody class that's produced. So they're the, if you know that somebody's titers are rising and you actually do a test and it's IgM titers are rising, you know that's, that's your disease, that's your diagnosis that you're actually dealing with. IgG is going to be the predominant um, antibody that's circulating around because these are going to be made by those memory cells. These are going to be the ones that are the highest titers. So you have so many IgG circulating. And the unique thing about IgG2 is that IgG class of antibodies, because of its structure, it can cross the placenta. So IgG antibodies, if a mother has antibodies against a particular disease and she, gets, she encounters that disease while she's pregnant, her fetus should be protected because her IgG antibodies are going to cross and protect the placenta and, and protect that fetus. They actually are going to protect that fetus IgG antibodies from the mother for a few weeks even after delivery because they'll stay around for a little while. They don't last forever, so the, the neonate is going to be protected by the mother's IgG if the mother had IgG antibodies to particular things. That doesn't mean people should take their neonates out to parties, but, um, but anyway... They, they do have a few weeks protection from the mother's IgG antibodies if the mother had them present. The IgA class of antibodies are going to be found in body fluids. So they're going to be in tears, saliva, breast milk, and any of the body's types of fluids. And then the IgE e antibodies, the class of antibodies, are going to be produced in response to allergens. So if somebody has allergies or parasites even, this IgE titers are going to end up going up. Some people have such a strong IgE response that they have a hypersensitivity or responses like allergies, and it's that class of antibodies. If people are getting allergy shots, they're trying to get the immune system to stop producing IgE and convert and start producing IgG. Because if you have IgG antibodies, you're never going to have a sign or symptom of something. The IgD class is a class that's found on those receptor B cells and play a role in that specific immunity response. So these are the five classes you should know them, the basics of them. Why? Because titers of them in the lab can get you to a definitive diagnosis. And so that's why I want you to know that. And this talks about... Um, this talks about titers here. Now, I want you to know that there's some things called natural immunity and artificial. Natural immunity means that, you know, you've got immunity because maybe you got sick with the disease. And if you got sick with the disease and hopefully got over it, now you have memory cells. So you have immunity to it. Artificial immunity is from vaccines. So vaccines can be given to get somebody uh, immunity. When we talk about active immunity, it means that you're making your own antibodies. Please know that. Active immunity means you're making your own antibodies. You got sick, you're making your own antibodies, you won't be able to get that again, usually, usually. Or you got an immunization, a vaccine, and you made your you recognize that was a foreign antigen and you're making your own antibodies and you'll be protected. Passive immunity means that you're getting it from someone else. So a way of getting passive immunity as a baby is that you get it crossing the placenta in the form of IgG antibodies, or you're getting breast milk. So you're getting your mother's IgA antibodies if you're an infant. You might also get passive immunity if somebody is uh, giving you immunoglobulin. 
So this is often done for patients that we're going to give them their immune system a boost by giving them immunotherapy to help them to fight off diseases that they may not be able to do. So a difference between active and passive. Active, you're making your own antibodies. Passive, you're getting them from someone else. Vaccines, I do want you all, it just, I'm not going to do this in the lecture, but I want you all to look at these vaccines. Realize they're not all created equal, um, but I need for you to understand, and you know, not because I'm saying it, because you're going to do your own work on this, but the fact is that vaccines have changed, have saved millions of lives. For anything that's invasive, there are going to be potential side effects, but the the benefits for vaccines and immunizations, it has changed the world that we live in. Before immunizations happened, you had a 50-50 chance of your child seeing their fifth birthday. 50-50. That is not part of our reality anymore, and the major reason that is not part of our reality anymore is because of immunizations. So people who think that um, you know they're doing something by protecting their children by not getting them immunized, that is misinformation, and, and, and I would hope that no one who is educated or in the healthcare uh, profession would be, you know, um, sending out that signal because we need to, it's part of your role as a healthcare professional to educate and to let people know how many lives are being saved every, each and every year from the use of immunizations. People have forgotten what it was like to see children dying from measles, mumps, rubella, tetanus, polio, so whooping cough, so many diphtheria, diphtheria, so many different diseases. If, if enough of the, the beautiful thing is, because you can never convince everybody, uh, even if it's a good thing, but the beautiful thing is if we can get enough of our population uh, immunized, then it offers the entire population protection. So uh, it, that, that's referred to as herd immunity. If you can get a little bit more than 90% of the populations immunized, then even the few percent that are intermixed between, that the disease won't be able to get to them. They're going to be insulated and isolated and protected because the herd was protected. So please do your research, do your numbers, make sure that you understand that these are very protective. Um, and it, there's a lot of misinformation out there. People think that they can get the disease from the vaccine. That is absolutely for for most of the, for the ones you need to know about the vaccines you need to know about. That is absolutely false. You cannot get a, the disease from the immunization. You can get flu-like symptoms from it. Flu-like symptoms from an immunization because of the preservatives. You may you may coincidentally have gotten inoculated with an infectious dose of the organism when you got the vaccine so the vaccine didn't have time to protect you and so you ended up getting so you know there's things that happen like that but the vaccine cannot cause the disease so there's lots of uh, money hope, hopefully enough being put into the um, production of new vaccines because that is definitely something we're all excited about. This was a lot of learning objectives. Remember to study the learning objectives and how I say them, what I say. All the rest is icing and good luck with this, um, this part. I hope you found, found it interesting. Thank you.